Hello, everybody. I'm trying to reduce the glare on my glasses here. I think I might take them off. Because um, I'm in a different place today. And the light's a little bit different than what I'm used to. Um, so let's see. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless our time together. Bless those, ask you to bless those who are coming in. I ask you to bless my friend Michael Newman, who just had an operation. And I ask you to teach us today. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm going to take my glasses off because uh, I'm getting too much glare on my glasses. Um, all right. Well, we'll start. We're going to get a run and start for those who watch the video. And we're going to start back in in um, verse uh, chapter two, Acts two, verse thirty-seven. Bonsoir, Marie Chagnon. So, um, in Acts two thirty-seven, we're going to get a run and start on tonight's verses. Um, Peter had just said in, in thirty-eight and thirty-nine, he said, "Repent, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins." And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children. I'm sorry. Um, in verse uh, 36, it says, Let all the house, house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In verse 37, uh, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, let each of you be baptized um, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 39, For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So that's verse 39. In verse 40, and With many other words he testified, and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. The word perverse literally means to be warped or crooked. We're seeing a lot of perversion in the world today. This generation is a season. It's still the same generation. Um, the word uh, means to be warped or crooked. It means something that has been altered from its original intent and design. My question is, when isn't it, a per, perverse generation. I think humanity has been harmed in a perverse way, and it's only through receiving Jesus as Lord and experiencing his restoring touch that we can ever step into his intention for our lives. I'm going to just stop here for a second. You can see my backdrop looks a little different today. I'm on the road. Um, Marie, I am um, uh, visiting with Michael Newman, who just had um, some minor surgery, and so I'm here to serve him. And I'm staying with somebody else until Michael gets out of the hospital or not tomorrow. And then I'll be nursing him, basically, um, being his nurse and his cook and his uh, chauffeur until he's back up and running again. So I'm in a different place. And if I'm still down here on Monday, I'll be in another place. I'll be in Michael's living room, probably. And so in Acts uh, 241, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now there is a woman named Lynn that I have pastored for many years. Sometimes in a worship service in a church building or worshiping simply in our living room, she will yell out, yay, God. And that's exactly what the word gladly, when it says um, those who gladly receive this word, that's exactly what the word gladly means in verse 31. It means to uh, basically they, to be a, a out there with how happy they are about something. Most often in the New Testament, the word received is, is translated from the Greek word lambano. This time, however, it's a different word. The Greek word apon, apodekomae, oh, it's A-P-O-D-E-C-H-O-M-A-I, and it means welcomed and fully took. So these people welcomed and fully took the word that Peter had given. Think about it. Peter told them that they had killed the Messiah. And that is part of the word that they gladly received. Um, and the word that they gladly received um, had to do with 
with um, being told that they had murdered Jesus. So that's that's not happy, you know, but that's that's what it's talking about. And so think about that. That's part of the word that they gladly receive. The takeaway from this is, is that when a person's heart is for the Lord, even the hard things are gladly received. However, it is okay to say ow on occasion. They received the word gladly with pleasure, and 3,000 souls were added to the body of Christ. That's how it's worked. When someone is saved, that person is added to the ecclesia, the body of Christ. The word added is a Greek word that literally means lay alongside. This highlights something that I've taught here many times which is that there is no hierarchy in God's church, from his perspective anyway. In other words, every Christian is equal. We are, law, we are all, like the scripture says, alongside one another. There's Jesus. He's the head, Ephesians 4.15. And the rest of us are below him. All of us, all of us on the same level. In, in verse 42, Acts 2.42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, these first believers continued steadfastly in doing several things. The term continued steadfastly means to be earnest towards, to persevere, to be constantly diligent, to adhere close to, to give, one, to give oneself continually. Now, often... My experience has been that when this passage is taught, the emphasis is on, is on usually put on being diligent about the apostles' doctrine or adhering closely to the apostles' doctrine. And that's good, since the apostles' teaching is truth. I mean, where'd they get that from? They got it right from Jesus' mouth. And so that's a good thing. We should hold on to that, but that's not all that that verse says. They held to several things. The first, is the apostles doctrine which is the simply which is simply their teachings that's what the word doctrine means the second is fellowship which literally means that they saw themselves as being in partnership in participation and an impartation and the word impartation means that what the spirit supplied whether it be praise or wisdom or teaching or whatever it was it flowed between them. That's what impart means. You know, I impart something to someone else. Not only did they see themselves this way, but they actively lived it in that they were an active part of one another's lives. A, the third thing that they, they held to, so we have the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. The third thing they held to is the breaking of bread. Now, this can mean that they had the Lord's Supper on a regular basis, but it most likely simply means that they regularly ate meals together. And the reality is they probably had the Lord's Supper each time they did that, not just once a week or once a month or once a quarter or every six months. They, they would have the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. Some of the people I've been in fellowship with uh, through Don Gunner, who was the guy who watched over my soul for so long, um, is every time we had a meeting, we had the Lord's Supper. And that was pretty cool. It was a pretty cool way to celebrate the fact that we were in fellowship. And so so they they held to they held to or they continued to practice the um the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, which meant that they saw themselves being part of one another, and they imparted something back and forth. Three, the breaking of bread, which most likely was meals, most likely included the Lord's Supper. And um, they held to prayers. So that's what it says in verse 41. They continued fasting. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now we had, are told they adhered closely to fellowship as well as the apostles' teachings, in the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, as well as meals, and that they adhered closely to praying. In other words, they worshiped. This was their way of life. And I believe it's our supernatural way of life to this day. Have you, ever, have you any of you, or have you, because two, two people in here right now, have you ever been hammered by a spiritual leader to do these things? 
that we must do these things? I have. And you know what I think? I think these people were bullied, but I don't think these people, these first Christians, were bullied by the apostles to do these things. I think that they did those things in a spiritually instinctive way. They prayed because they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And praying was, if you will, their new normal. It was their natural way of being as Christians. They fellowshiped. They spent time sharing their lives with their brethren because they, they shared the same spirit, the same king, and the same father. It was normal for them to share with one another, to be with one another. We're going to see that. I'm writing in, in chapter four right now, my notes about chapter four. And it's obvious that they shared everything. Um, it was normal for them to be with one another, to impart to one another. All those meanings of fellowship, they, they didn't have to be bullied into it. They just did it. They instinctively kept the apostles' doctrine. It was easy for them to do this. Why is it so difficult for so many Christians to want to be with and to enjoy being in small, intimate groups with other believers? Why was it almost automatic for them, yet isn't for most of us? And I believe there's several reasons for this. One of them is that much of the body of Christ over the last 1,700 years has been taught that the Holy Spirit basically isn't working anymore like he did in the first century and before the Bible was written. So that's a doctrine that's out there right now. The other is that after almost 2,000 years of the church being in existence, we've been taught that we have to do it or dire things will happen to us, that it has to happen in a dedicated church building in the two to five hours a week that it's open, and that if you can't be there, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss the experience. We've, we've narrowed all of Christian life down to some events that happen when people schedule them. Meanwhile, according to God and according to his word, we Christians are the church. The idea that we have to do it or else is called law, L-A-W. And legalism actually causes people to sin. In Romans 5.20, a verse that the first time I heard it, I didn't believe it was really written like that. And the law came so that transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Whenever someone is told that they might must do something, the temptation to not do it immediately seeps in. And when the church started to be institutionalized in AD 300, church attendance became an obligation and not a simple joy. In Acts 2.42, repeating it again, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. I believe it's great to encourage people to do the things the very first Christians did, the, the things they did so instinctively as new believers, but I also belong, believe that it is wrong to insist that people pray or read the word of God, or attend any meetings in any format in the body of Christ, even, even house church or any kind, simple, organic house church, institutional church. I think it's wrong to force people to do this. The Lord extends an invitation for him to be in prayer with him, in the doctrines of the apostles, in fellowship, and in the breaking of bread. And those who come should come because they want to be there and not because they're compelled to be there. Now that might sound sacrilegious because we're used to hearing people beat, beat us with the legalistic whips. But li listen to these verses. Philemon 1.14, without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be as if it were by compulsion, but, or rather, of your own free will. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, let each one do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, not under compulsion. 
Some 1,700 years of churchianity has brought us back under the law in many cases, and Christians often sit in those places, some part of their heart resenting that they have to do this, that they have to be there. It affects them in a negative way, the way that they approach the Lord. Meanwhile, the truth is that we are free in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, the word says this, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We are free to dive into the deep end of the pool with the Lord and with his people in prayer, fellowship, and all those things. All those things mentioned in Acts 2.42. We are free also to deny ourselves the blessings, the blessings in those things. How do we get free of the law? This is crucial because many of us are controlled by expectations and fear and other people's manipulations and other part and the ways the law manifests all the time. Romans 8:34 says this, what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Why? so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Many of us spend a lot of our lives feeling guilty. We haven't sinned, but we still feel the guilt. We feel guilt for breaking some law, some human imposed on us, or worse, that we've imposed on ourselves so that we would behave well. We meet most of the time in our fellowship in our home we tell people we're meeting we don't tell them you better be there we just say we're meeting here's what we're meeting and basically here's what we're eating and and i can't tell you how many times people have apologized for not being at a place that is a voluntary thing why do we apologize for that it's because we've been taught that if we don't show up wherever they're having a spiritual event then we're somehow out of order as a law and so i hope that we can learn how to um deal with that so so people impose on us or we impose on ourselves some laws so that we'll behave well we, we impose this do it or else thing all along jesus wants to fulfill for us the perfection that law requires if we would receive him for that i think there's a lot of freedom available for some of us taking part in this study. All we have to do is turn to the, to the Lord and receive him for freedom. Hey, Kathy, I saw you come in. You don't have to apologize for being late. It's a voluntary study. But also I wanted to point out, you know, to those who came late, that um, this isn't my usual backdrop. I'm staying with a friend while I um, minister to some, so a guy, a pastor, who had an operation today. And um, there's not a lot of people in his life jumping forward to to help him after he gets out of the hospital tomorrow. So, so I'm going to take care of him for a few days. And so I'm teaching a Bible study uh, where I am. I used to teach by typing in a chat room. I can't tell you how many times I taught these classes um, in hotel rooms while I was on the road ministering someplace. So anyway, that's why it looks different. I think we did one of the Ephesians or one of the John studies here too. So Acts 2.42 again. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. The reason these people did this is because they were free of man-imposed law, and we could be free too. So perhaps you'd like to join me in a prayer right now for this to happen in our lives. And so I'm going to type this, ad this uh, address in here, my email. Make sure I do that right. Um, in case you know, in case you ever want the prayers that we pray, you can just email me for them. So let's pray this prayer together where we are, if you want. Um, if you trust me, uh, then we can pray without me reading it first. Father, we ask you to free us from any man-made expectations that have been imposed on us, so that we will be controlled by the law. We receive freedom from the law of sin and death as we walk in the life of Christ. We acknowledge that where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. Free me, please, to worship you in spirit and in truth and in the joy of my salvation and never out of compulsion. 
make me allergic to the efforts of man, the law, and Satan through those to impose anything on me. Thank you for my freedom. I pray this in the liberating name of Jesus. Amen. You know, freedom is an interesting thing. We can be positionally free and still not leave, live in freedom, remaining in bondage conditionally. So we've been positionally free and in bondage conditionally. After the slaves were free in the United States, they were literally, legal, as legally speaking, there were no slaves in the USA because they had been proclaimed to be free. But many still lived as slaves at first because it took a while for the news to reach them. And at this time in Christian history, this very thing happens to us for pretty much the same reason. It is taught in many congregations that the Spirit of God is no longer active in the miraculous sense, and people buy that, trusting spiritual leaders and never reading the Bible for themselves. In addition, many of us are taught that being a Christian actually means to live by the law of performing perfectly in order to receive God's approval. If you don't believe it, think about how many times you went and said, this has gone wrong in my life, and people begin to ask you, did you do this right? 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 Or did you remember to do this? And it's, it's just cause and effect. If I perform perfectly, God will bless me. If I don't perform perfectly, which nobody can perform perfectly, but if I don't, then obviously I'm messed up. Those of us who attempt to live this out try and fail repeatedly. If we try to obey the law of someone else's conditions that they put in our life, we're going to try it because we think we have to, to be good in God's eyes, but we're going to fail repeatedly. Christianity is miserable for them, and some of the people drop away, tiring of the constant failure. So the next time somebody says, where's Bob? And someone else says, Bob has fallen away. Maybe he has. Maybe he has because he's tired of trying to do the impossible, something that God never put on us to do. He has given us grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Some have heard the truth that Jesus wants to live his life through us, Galatians 2.20, and that his righteousness has been given to us. Uh, God made the Father, the Father made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so we can become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Some, some people have heard that as these receive this truth, they can live it and benefit for what Christ has done for us. You know, some of those slaves heard that they were freed. Of those, some didn't believe us. Some of us have heard we're free in Christ, but down in our hearts, we don't really believe that. We think we're still in bondage. We somehow twist scriptures that tell us that Jesus came to set captives free, Luke 4.18, to make them mean that we have to physically die before we can finally be free. Of the American slaves who heard, some believed it, and this is tragic, but they were too afraid to step out into their freedom. Many of our brothers and sisters find security in their straitjackets and handcuffs in the law. Living out a rule-bound Christian life is safe for them. Now, I want us to all hear this. Safe is not safe. Safe kills us slowly. There were many slaves who heard that they were freed, believed it, risked the pain, pushed past their fear and their discomfort, stepped out and encountered resistance, but stayed at it, but stayed at it. And they stayed at it anyway. And they depended on the entity that set them free to keep them free. Do you see the parallel? Jesus has set us free. Now that we are free for the sake of Christ, let's not go back into bondage. I'm going to address your question in a minute, Kathy. Um, Galatians 5, 1 says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So let's do what the freed American slaves did, since we too are former slaves, to sin. Let's depend on the entity, Jesus, who set us free 
to keep us free. Amen? Now, why did I do that? Why did I ask for an amen, something I rarely do in real life? Was it so I can get an affirmation? From, where is that thing? From you? Was it to see if you were paying attention? No. It was to call us all to a place of agreement with the word of God. It's to give us a chance for us all to decide and voice if we want what we just discussed to be real in our lives. Therefore, a silent amen will work, but a loud resounding decision is in order if we want this biblical truth to be of any benefit to us. And so, Sherry, we were just talking about being free in Christ and living free in Christ. And so if, if you want to, let's pray this out loud. And again, I put my um, email address up there if you want this prayer. And you can read the prayer and decide if you want to pray it. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to free me. Lord Jesus, thank you for freeing me from bondage and sin. I commit to following you and to remaining free. Holy Spirit, I ask you to guide me into all truth and to warn me when I, lost fo when I lose focus and begin to go spiritually adrift. I commit to listening to you and obeying you, repenting as I do. I thank you. I pray this in the empowering and free name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you prayed that prayer out loud so you can live a free life. Um, I think you can live a free life without my little prayer. But there's something about that that makes us re receive the things that we're just committed to. And it's good to let the devil hear himself losing ground, too. Um, so Kathy asked, do you, do you have unconfessed sin is a big question, meaning that she's heard that asked many times. I believe everybody does, to tell you the truth. I think that, that um, we can't keep up. With that, I mean, we'll be sinning and confessing, you know, you wouldn't be able to get any work done, you know. Um, I believe that God has an answer to that whole idea. In 1 John 1 7, it says that if we walk in the light, then the blood of Christ continually washes away our sin. So our sin debt or the sin that we had on our permanent record gets washed away. Well, what about confession? There are some people that wrongly teach that we don't need to confess our sins. And I don't think that's true because 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins to one another, God is faithful to make you righteous. So I believe that as God reveals sin to us, we should confess that to someone else, not necessarily a spiritual leader. You can just turn to your spouse or your best friend, or you can say it in a chat room or whatever, um, and say, I just realized that I've been doing this, that I've been sinning this way. And what that does is it makes you feel as clean in your soul, it takes the burden or the guilt of the sin away, the sin that was washed away when you sinned by the continually flowing blood of Christ. So I believe, yeah, you know, I think I think that deals with it, Kathy, and I appreciate you bringing it up because there's a whole lot of people out there um, that are, are, are teaching that, you know, you better, better for, you know, confess all your sins or God's not going to forgive you for them. I don't believe that's true. And so... These people in verse 42 and 43, Acts 2, 42 and 43, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, the Greek word translated as fear here means the word awe, A-W-E like blown away, awe, and be in awe of somebody, be blown away. Imagine this from the perspective of someone not reading the Bible about this happening almost 2,000 years before, after it happened. Some of these people who were there on the day of Pentecost very well may not have been exposed to the miracles of Jesus. Imagine how the day of Pentecost went for them. These people were in a room afraid, some of them had seen Jesus do miracles. All of them had probably heard about it. Some of them probably never saw him do that. They're in a room. They're afraid. There's a sound like a rushing wind. The Holy Spirit, like tongues of fire, is on them. They run outside and begin speaking language that they can, can't normally speak, but that the hearers can understand. 
Then Peter speaks a message that pierced the hearts of those listening. They repent, are saved, and are baptized. Then they experience these Jesus-like miracles. God has their attention. They are awestruck. Wouldn't our days go a little bit differently if we were awestruck on a constant basis by what God is doing in our lives? In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, now all who believe were together and they had all things in common. Do you see that first part? Now all who believe were together. The word peace, that's the definition. That's a true definition of peace among mankind that they would they were together. Do you see the second part? They had all things in common. That is the that is the proper response to peace among men and women. If Jesus is our Lord, let's think about this. What do we own anyway? Nothing. He purchased us. It's all his. So these people acted as if it really was all his. Now, how's that for a wild and biblical concept? Verses 44 and 45. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, initially and specifically, this refers to a need that existed at the time this was happening. In context, people had gone to Jerusalem for a feast. And they budgeted for that. But due to being born again in the events of Pentecost, they stayed a lot longer than they planned to stay. Their money was running out. All the converts loved one another. So those who lived there sold things so that the others could stay and soak in the fellowship, the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread and prayer. Isn't that beautiful? I've noticed that this sort of need isn't always at hand, but when it is, and when we live like this, it is so right, and it feels so right. When we live the attitude that everything we have belongs to Jesus, we have a whole lot less stress if it looks like it might be taken either by him or uh, if, he, if we might be being led to give to him. It's a whole lot of stress that many of us experience that we don't have to experience, but we do because we don't really believe that Jesus owns us. What would it be like if we spent our lives alertly listening to the Lord and seeking where we're to share something that we have? You know, one of the things, our ministry, our primary ministry is a counseling and discipleship ministry in Decatur, Texas. I do a lot of writing, obviously I teach, and uh, help out in pulpits, things like that. Um, but one of the things that the ministry, our ministry does is that people call us and say, do you know anybody that has a dresser or a refrigerator or a washer or a dryer? And the reason that we're able sometimes to say yes is because there are people in our locale that live like this. They'll buy a washing machine or a dryer and they'll keep the old one so that if someone else needs it, they can have it. You know, I think last year we moved like eight sets of those from one owner to another. And now that I'm getting up in age a little bit, I didn't even have to pick up most of those things. People came and got them or delivered them to somebody. I think that's awesome. There's a minister in Boyd, Texas, um, who um, heard that we needed a washer for somebody. And the next thing I know, he's at my house and he's putting it in my backyard. And um, that's, that's Miller Buckholtz. And I thought that was awesome that um, he didn't just sit there and waited to be waited on. He, he was actively serving somebody else. So there are people that do this. There are people that give away their stuff, that give their money to people because it's necessary. And that just warms my soul to see it happen. But it's not the norm. And so in verse 46, so continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So, yeah, they met in the temple. Why? Because they were used to going there. They were making contacts there. They were teaching. They were hanging out in the temple until they got booted out of there. And then they didn't do that anymore. They said they continued daily with one accord. The term one accord means unanimously or with one mind. I wonder whose mind that would be. 
Well, 1 Corinthians 2.16 says this, For who has known the mind of the Lord that, may, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. They were in one accord or with one mind. They were so in tune with the Holy Spirit of Christ that they functioned as a cooperative unit with one accord. No one had to sit them down and give them the just so we're all on one page talk. Have you gotten that talk? I've gotten that talk a whole bunch of times. I refuse to give that talk. As a leader in the body of Christ, I'm not going to sit around and bully someone into agreeing with whatever the game plan is. Basically, what a leader does is a leader leads. That's what I was taught by Don Gunner. And what that means is if the Lord puts it on our heart to do something, and we believe the Lord would have us participate in it, we simply say, this is what the Lord has us doing. And then we go start doing it. And if people are following us, they, if they submit to us, or if, they, uh, if we watch over their souls, then the next thing you know, they're there. And they're being a part of it. You don't have to give them the, let's make sure we're all on one page talk. They're just doing it. These people simply allowed the Holy Spirit to guide them just like Jesus said the Holy Spirit would. In John 16, 13a, when he, Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all the truth. So he's going to guide them. You know, we can live like that too. In fact, that is how we're designed to live in Christ. We're designed to follow the Holy Spirit. And when a bunch of people are following the Holy Spirit, they pretty much fly in one unit. Acts 246 again. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They continued to unanimously gather to daily in the temple, which was being replaced. I mean, think about that. The temple was there, but it was being replaced with 3,000 plus walking and talking temples. That's what is known as a Christian. So the temple was being replaced with 3,000 plus walking, talking temples, and the number was growing every day, and they met in homes. The season of needing an expensive building dedicated to worshiping God was over. And when they no longer were welcome in the temple or the synagogues, they met in the workplace, down by the river, in homes, which is now which is how we as a group simply gather in our homes. They broke bread together. This simply means that they routinely had meals together, and often at these meals they would take what we now know as the Lord's Supper. These meals are mentioned in Jude chapter 1, verse 12, and that's the term love feasts. That's literally what it meant. And it's also meant, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11. And also in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. These were called love feasts by Jude because the sharing, well, and that was what they called them apparently in the first century, because they were sharing their lives, and that fed them. It fed their spirits. This happened as each spoke of what they were experiencing as they walked with the Lord. This really was a feast in which, in which love from God through each Christian present nourished the souls of each of those Christians. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I mean when, when, when I first met the guy that used to watch over my soul before his death, Every time I met with anybody he was associated with, they would ask what your name was, and they would look you in the eye, and they'd say, what is the Lord showing you? What has the Lord given you? What do you have, basically, to share with the group? And we practice this all the time. If I have a men's meeting, like uh, just a meal together on a Thursday night, that's what we all pretty much always ask. What is the Lord showing you? What's he showing you in the Word? Did he give you a song? Did he show you something just out here? Did the Lord reveal something to you? It, it could very well be that if you're connected with someone 
and God showed that person something or showed you something in the word of God or any way that God wants to share it with you, that the person that God connected you to might very well need that thing too. And so, well, I'll just say something. Um, I did the memorial service for my friend Rayburn Rule on Saturday. I watched over his soul. Oh, I met him in 2001. And I've probably been watching over his soul since 2002. And it's to 2019 now. So, so um, a long time. We we traveled together. We did a lot of things. One of the things that I said was I quoted a verse out of Acts later in Acts that says that God has determined the times and the boundaries of our habitation. In other words, He has determined that we would be geographically wherever it is we are, and in history, when we would be in those places. And that means that, you know, I, there's several people here that I met and it was like a chance meeting, but God knew it. And a lot of these people are still connected with one another. And so if we're gathering at a love feast, like which might be at a restaurant or it might be in a truck or a van going someplace or whatever it is, if we're gathering with somebody, it could be in a Sunday school class, it could be at a fellowship hall meeting, whatever it is. Then, then it's it's what they said. They they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They went from place to place. And in Act in the First Corinthians fourteen, it says that when you brought something, when you came together, you bring something from the Lord and you share it with one another. And it could change a person's life. It could change hundreds of people's lives through that person. So I think it's important for us to think about going. A lot of times, ministers will say. Come expecting to get something. Well, that's great. I mean, the, the assumption is you're going there and something's going to go into you that's good. But but why don't we go thinking that maybe I'm there to give something and it'll be valuable for them. So they were called love feasts by Jude in Jude one twelve because the sharing of lives fed them. Luke said this of the very first Christians. He said in verse 46, um, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The word translated as gladness means exaltation and welcome. I think if we would spend less time complicating things and more time enjoying simplicity of heart, we would all be a whole lot happier. If, if we spent our time with gladness, exaltation and welcome and simplicity of heart, not overcomplicating things, just being happy and enjoying it. Luke goes on telling us that they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved, Acts 2.47. The term having favor means that people received them spiritually with a lot of graciousness. It's a way of saying that they just visited with people and led them to Jesus easily. It wasn't hard for them to do this. What, hap what that happens to this very day when we abandon man-made programs and earthly evangelistic scheming and just simply build relationships and share Jesus naturally. Now I've been a part of evangelism in prisons and door knocking and doing a whole lot of man-made programs and stuff. And there's a lot of people I know that were saved in those things. But what if we just live the life? What if someone next to us turns to us and says, why do you live the way you live? There's something different about you. And you just build relationships and just share Jesus naturally and organically. So in Acts 46, 47, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And as we read, we're going to see that doing that, it cost them. Because there was going to be some people who had a lot to benefit from people not leaving the system they were in. And they're going to give these people some grief but it's worth it. This is how the very first Christians lived and how they practiced their faith and had an effect on the people around them. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Notice that the Lord added them to the church 
and not to subsets of the church. The church was and is one body, despite what man has done to slice and dice it into thousands of mostly non-cooperative pieces parts. The church consists of all born again people who are being saved. And we'll look at that more closely in a little bit. So when someone received Jesus as his Lord, that person was added to the rest of the church and to the other born again people. And that still happens. I believe that God looks at us and sees one body. He doesn't see us in terms, I'm marking something. <laughs> he doesn't see us in terms of a large subset of his body, a denomination, or a small subset of his body, a congregation. He simply sees his people. And that's it. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved, Acts 247b. Imagine that. Imagine watching the body of Christ grow before your very eyes. No programs, no schemes, no advertising, no marketing pushes, no door prizes, no fleshly anything. They watch the Lord add to the church daily, to the church daily. And it all happened without expensive church buildings, paved parking lots, stages, big digital signs, concert lighting, smoke machines, programs, and all that stuff. How? The Lord added to the church daily. The way it happened was that people didn't do it. God did it daily. The lost people could see a difference in the formerly lost people around them and what they witnessed was simply the Lord at work in them. The greatest evangelistic method, if you will, of all, has always been Christians living in dependency upon the Lord with simple yet evident faith in him. That is how the Lord added to the church daily. He touched people's hearts and they lived a dependent life upon the Lord. He still does that despite all the man-made schemes the church system uses today. May we, may we witness that with our own eyes soon. May we just see it happen. Well, that concludes uh, chapter two of the book of Acts. For those who are just here, I'm in, I'm in Houston taking care of one of the guys, a pastor, and he had an operation today, and I came here to, to um, take care of him. And um, so I'm in a bedroom in Houston right here teaching today. Laurie's holding down the floor at home and there's other people watching over her. Um, what stuck out at you, uh, Kathy Preston? Uh, I'm not sure what you were talking about there. Well, she'll type it in. Chapter three, X three one. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now devout Jews went to the temple three times a day to pray, morning at 9 a.m., afternoon at 3 p.m., and then again in the evening at sunset. And this verse says that they went at the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m. Now Peter and John were, were Christian believers, so why were they observing a Jewish custom? Well, several reasons come to mind. The first is habit. That was their custom to do that. That's, that's what it says. Secondly, they were there to lead other Jewish people to Christ. What better place to fish than where people who are interested in God are already going? And the third is that they were first century Jews. They were taught to go to the temple three times a day to pray. So they did. There's a good chance that they went to the temple for all three of those reasons, that it was habit, it's what they were taught to do, and that they were there to, to connect with other people and introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're Christians. Our new normal is to follow Jesus personally, each one of us. And God doesn't always tell all of us to do every little thing exactly the same way. In the end, we will answer to him not to other Christians, and not to lost people. For some of us, God has a plan that entails moving 
from one way of approaching him to another way. Okay. Um, what he moves us to, perhaps a more intimate way of dealing with him, other, other, other people won't see it, what we're doing and what we're seeing as we see it. For some of us, God has that plan. If the people around us are Christians, they're us. They're one body. Even if they don't understand why we obey God the way we do, or even if they don't express that they don't understand it in, un, in, in kind ways, if they're unkind about it, um, they're still us. They are us. Therefore, it's good and right for us to live out that unity as best we can. I say this because it's been my experience that we often find ourselves staying in what feels like a stale place for the benefit of others who aren't called into different Christian expressions the way we might be be drawn. Some of us, uh, for, for us to see more doesn't make us spiritually superior. It just means the king wants us to see it for his glory, to build his kingdom. So it's not bad to stay there for a while as directed by the Lord. The way I communicate this is that I stay until I'm released to go. And when I'm released to move on, and not released by some human, but by the king, since he and only he owns me. So Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. The term went up. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to drink water. The term went up as an attempt that means that they regularly and habitually did this. It was their routine to do this. These were people led by the Holy Spirit. And apparently the Holy Spirit told them to go to, to the temple at 3 p.m. to pray every day. How often do we become bored with our spiritual routines and presume that since we're bored with them, that there's no life in them? It seems on this day, God had arranged an appointment for John and Peter. Sometimes, you know, it's just not about us. Sometimes we're going to be uncomfortable or in a routine, and it'll be for somebody else's benefit. Let's not let our own boredom cause us to miss something the Lord is about to do in our lives. Acts 3, verse 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. The lame man was laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful this is written in the same tense that was used to describe peter and john's routine of going to the temple daily at 3 p.m in other words it was the habit of whoever took the man there every day to take him there regularly and habitually to take him there regularly and habitually i just accidentally pasted something in the window there so every day they put him in that very same spot and this is important for us to see because something's going to happen that day and every day almost all the ingredients to it happening were in place every day all the ingredients were there every day peter and john go there every day the lame man is there on this day though there is a different additional element in place this time the holy spirit causes peter to minister to the man why this day why not some other day only god knows you know often i've, I've had little kids tell me why why should you do that they would say because god says this day, God says, why that day? I don't know. Why not another? I don't know. Uh, it's been He's been there for years. We do know, though, that the Holy Spirit who searches a man's heart knows that on this day, the man will receive. This day, apparently, it's the exact right time. Also, and this is important, since any of us with the mind, uh, since any of us with the, with the mind to minister Jesus to people, 
uh, either minister to people his his freedom or him or his sight or Jesus's restoration on and on that were always literally surrounded with opportunities to minister the need is literally endless so it's important for us to see that God's timing is important we must seek God's leading in this we must follow his direction and what to do and when and where and with whom and to whom we must if we are to accomplish what his plans are for us and for those around us people have a tendency i've done this so i'm telling you i'm confessing i've done this we've done it this way before so every single time i see that i do it the same way i don't really believe that's the truth i don't think that god is limited to what he had us do in the past so god might say to say something a different way I've seen people speak to somebody. I've also seen people sit down next to someone and not say a word and lead a person to Christ that way. I know that I was doing hospice once when I was a hospice chaplain and I walked into a home and the only light in the room was snowing. The only light in the room was a fire that was burning. And I never said a word in that house. I was there for about 40 minutes. I came in, I nodded to the lady whose son was dying. I went in and prayed over him. I did my paperwork and I walked out and then I went to nod to her and she just kind of beckoned me to sit next to her in a recliner chair next to hers. And we sat there for about a half hour, not saying a word. The only sound was the popping of a fire in the fireplace. Finally, she tapped, tapped me on the arm, you know, and pointed to the door and I, I nodded and she nodded, never said a word and I left. And a few days later, her son passed. And then later that year, I was at a football game and she, she caught my attention. And she said, she said, I asked her how she's doing. She said she was doing well. I said, what's up? And she goes, I'll never forget the things you told me that day while we were sitting there watching the fire. It really helped me out. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing so well. It would be easy for me to think that all I need to do is sit, sit down next to, you know, guilt, grieving people or guilty people or sad people and just sit there because it worked that time that for the rest of my life, that would be my ministry. But God told me to be quiet. So I was quiet. And next time he might tell me to speak. So let's not fall into the trap of I did it this way, so I always should do it this way, or I'll um, find myself in that, in that situation and pull the trigger on that thing and then get disappointed. Why didn't it happen like it happened last time? Everybody's unique. God made us unique, uniquely, and every situation is unique. And so we should keep that in mind. Let's just follow him. And so it's important for us to seek that. And so a certain lame man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried out, whom they laid daily at the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple. The beggar there, as are all totally disabled people, was at the mercy of other people. He could not work. He exemplifies in the physical sense the spiritual condition of all people before having Jesus in their lives. In Ephesians 2, verse 12, Paul says, At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He is in the physical and spiritual sense, as we were in the spiritually, we were spiritually prior to salvation. We had no hope. He was laid at the gate beautiful by someone. Guess what the word gate beautiful literally means? This is gorgeous. It, gate beautiful in the original language when you translate it means the door to that which belongs to the right hour or season. I think it's significant. For this man, this day is the right hour. It's time for this man to get a touch from the Lord. We routinely have simple first century style church church meetings in our home. 
We call them gatherings because that's the basic definition of the Greek word um, that that um, means the word church. One Saturday, we were praying for a woman who is fairly new to the group. We didn't know it, but she was having a bad day. She didn't want to come to the meeting, but her husband and daughters urged her to come, and she did anyway. It was a gate beautiful experience for her. The right time and season for God to give her a touch of his love. She showed up, and so did the Lord in a tangible way, and I think it really blessed her. You know, every time God ministers through us, the same thing happens. Another time I was passing through the St. Louis area with a man that I pastored at the time, and our friends there put us up for the night. We showed up at their house when they had a supper meeting planned. I really wanted to sleep. In fact, when all the people showed up, it's a small house, I was in my vehicle asleep in the back. I'd laid down the seats, and I was crashed out because I was exhausted. Um, I didn't want to participate. But I pushed through what I wanted to do, and I sat in on the meeting. And before you know it, God stepped in and ministered mightily to a husband and wife. And I was just humbled to be the person he worked through. It was a completely unplanned thing by us, but not by God. He knew what he intended to do. He knew what he was going to do that night. And that couple was at Gate Beautiful that night. So we're going to stop there for today. We'll pick up again next Monday. Um, I don't know. I might be in this room. I might be in Michael Newman's dining room teaching. Uh, yay for technology. I appreciate y'all coming. Be praying for him. He had two big kidney stones removed today. He was feeling no pain when I left. I'm going to go pick him up tomorrow and bring him home and take care of him. Um, to pray for Michael to recover easily from his is uh, Michael Newman from his kidney stone operation and for there to be no infections or any bad side effects and no hassles with the medical community. So um, thank you all for coming. Drusilla, I see you. Thanks for showing up. I'm sorry we're done. Um, let's pray and then we'll call it a night and we'll meet again next Monday. Father God, I thank you for the uh, lessons that we learned about the first century church. I ask you to show us how in your mind uh, it's the same church, one church right now, and that we, we are to function that way. I ask you to show us the ways that we um, are insulated from being able to just live simply, sharing our lives like the first century Christians did, and experiencing the awe and the joy and, and the just simplicity of your church and how exciting it was, and we can see it in the scriptures and and i ask you to give us plenty of um times like that times that were good exciting times that were hard exciting but that good things come out of i ask you for mostly to convict us of the areas in our hearts that we think we belong to ourselves and not to you and i ask you to bless us and i thank you for that in Jesus' name amen god bless you kathy give me five minutes and then give me a call. God bless y'all. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Maybe next time I'll be able to wear these without the light glaring all over them. Love you guys. Bye-bye.